real problem is this, James. In two decades, there will be seven billion human beings on this planet. Most of them brown, yellow, or black. All of them hungry. All of them determined to love. They'll swarm out of their breeding grounds into Europe and North America. Hence Vietnam. An all-out effort there will give us control of South Asia for decades to come. And with proper planning, we can reduce the population to 550 million by the end of the century. I know. I've seen the data. We sound rather like gods reading the Doomsday Book, don't we? Well, someone has to do it. Not only will the nations affected be better off, but the techniques developed there can be used to reduce our own excess population. Blacks. Puerto Ricans, Mexican Americans, poverty prone whites, and so forth. Context of white supremacy, Gusty Renegade, and Justice, and for another broadcast uh, to share constructive information on racism, white supremacy what it is and how it works. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning into the broadcast. Uh, one of the first things I uh, wanted to address, uh, I just got information uh, from RacismDaily.com, very constructive uh, website. Uh, the autopsy report for Frederick Germain Carter, uh, black male in Mississippi. <clears throat> he was found uh, hanging to death in December of 2010, and uh, they initially reported it as a suicide. Uh, they got the autopsy report, and it was ruled a hanging, not a suicide. Um, I uh, included the information in the description for uh, the first program that we did on Mr. Carter and his death, but I thought that was really important, uh, and it really hasn't been covered at all. Uh, not that that should be a major surprise, but uh, it really has not been covered at all, and I'm hoping we can do some uh, follow-up broadcasts um, to kind of cover what took place uh, with that young man and his death. Uh, at any rate, uh, that we'll have more to come on that as we uh, as we continue. Uh, but for this program, I uh, want to give thanks uh, Tater Pie. She uh, has been a longtime listener and supporter, and she found out the information uh, for our guest. Uh, for the broadcast uh, today, and I uh, just wanted to acknowledge her efforts. Right on for Tato Pie. Uh, our guest uh, for today's program, uh, joining us live from the United Kingdom, uh, he is uh, one of the pioneering uh, British reggae dance hall DJs, uh, as well as a social anthropologist, writer, researcher, consultant, and staff trainer for New Beyond Limited, uh, Learning by Choice. Uh, their website is linked uh, in the description for the program. Uh, that address, newbeyond.com. That's N-U-B-E-Y-O-N-D.com, newbeyond.com. Uh, our guest uh, is an internationally renowned lecturer. Uh, as I said, author, he's uh, published two books, uh, his first uh, offering uh, what the DJ said, a critique from the street. <clears throat> his second publication, uh, the one we'll spend more time with today, uh, 2007, Whiteness Made Simple, Stepping into the Gray Zone. A uh, really interesting book and a uh, really interesting <laughs> photo, uh, which, uh, I mean, that says a lot about racism, white supremacy. Anytime you see white Jesus, you already you already know what's up. Um, but real pleasure to have him uh, on the program. Uh, he has a uh, very impressive resume. Uh, he also uh, is the creator of Black Liberation African Knowledge, uh, B-L-A-K, Black Friday, uh, where on the last Friday of each month, grassroots community speakers present insights into the legacy of the Ma'afa, the African Holocaust, uh, from various perspectives as a way to provide practical solutions to real problems. Uh, he's been featured uh, in major documentaries, uh, including the uh, 2005 Bleach My Skin White. Uh, that should already resonate uh, with a lot of our listeners. Uh, as I said, real pleasure 
to have him on the program and uh, looking forward to exchanging views. Uh, our guest live from the UK, uh, Dr. William Les Henry. Uh, Dr. Henry, are you with us? Yeah, greetings, um, bro. Yes, I am. Good afternoon or probably good morning in stateside, isn't it? Uh, for me, yes, it's <laughs> good morning. Um, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to have you on the program. Um, thank you for sharing a bit of your uh, your Saturday afternoon with us. Um, for uh, folks who maybe they haven't they haven't visited the website, they haven't read some of your material. Uh, could you give just a little bit more background information so they'll know a little bit more about who you are and the work that you do? Okay. Um, well, my name is um, Dr. William Les Henry. Uh, most people in the UK know me as Dr. Les or whatever. And um, I find it hard to pigeonhole myself and put myself in a box, but my doctoral work was based on um, sociology and anthropology, so I suppose in some ways I'm a social anthropologist. But basically what informs my writing, and I'm also one of the pioneer British reggae dance or DJs, and I don't know if the news came across your side about um, the death of um, Smiley Culture, who was one of the pioneer British DJs. He died under suspicious circumstances last week, whilst um, his premises was being searched by the police. So um, there's a lot of um, stuff in the community about that, what's going on now. But basically, I used to voice my concerns on sound systems, so... That's like um, Shaggy or Beanie Man or Buju, that kind of um, DJing. What in America you call rapping, in, the, in England we call it, I don't know, toasting or DJing or MCing or whatever. So I used to use that as a platform to voice my concerns because I've always been into language, usage of language. I've always been into, um, you know, how can we verbalize and express what it means to be African in a very anti-African world. Well, the world is an anti-human world, let's get that right. But in particular, it affects uh, members of the African branch of the human family in, in various ways. And because in this manifestation, that is what I am, an African, then I speak to those concerns, and I've been doing so for years. Um, during the early 1990s, I decided to return to academia, full-time education. I wanted to get a PhD because I knew it would open certain doors for me and it would enable me to, to go and speak what I believe is aspects of our collective position in arenas where they normally wouldn't let us in or they wouldn't let me in. So I give thanks that, you know, with the support of my family and the community and certain friends, etc., that I had the fortitude to go through the academic process and come out with my mind intact. So I think I think that's where I am today, really. Um, for uh, folks listening in who may not have seen you, uh, you are a black male. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. My parents are from Jamaica. I was born in the UK, in London, and um, yes, I'm absolutely an African man, absolutely. Um, this broadcast, the context of white supremacy, I have unfortunately concluded that we are in a global system of racism, mm -hmm. white supremacy. That's right. Um, I use those two terms as synonyms, and I use the same definition for both terms. Uh, the definition I use is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as as not white. Uh, do you believe that such a system exists and do you think that definition is accurate? I think that definition is accurate when you're speaking in the context of people who aren't white. Um, as Eldridge Cleaver pointed out in an article as crinkly as yours years ago, if you call them non-white, you're still empowering them. But the people who, 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 who reclassify the world call 
called themselves Caucasians and, you know, classified everybody else, Africans, Mongoloids, whatever. The fact is, that system was designed by, in, in my humble opinion, that system of white, global white supremacist thought and action, which I talk about in my book, Whiteness Made Simple. The system was designed by a particular class and caste of Europeans. And I think that, yes, first and foremost, it was designed to subjugate the people who didn't look like them phenotypically, so if we want to call them white, and the people who didn't look white, but it also um, militates against many of their own people. I actually believe that the people who are in control of this system would quite easily wipe out members of their own supposed race to perhaps rid the world of the other so-called races. So I agree with your, your definition, but I think that it should have that addendum as well because if you look at even some of these wars that are taking place in the world over resources you know they can couch them in terms of race if they want or it could be you know anti-islam or religion or whatever we want to say but they're quite willing to sacrifice certain members of their own so-called race and that is the people who are, who are who more or less control this system so in that sense, I'm in agreement, but I also think we should add that as well. Uh, I'm, I'm in total agreement. I do see a lot of uh, what, I, what I reference, and, and Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. coined the phrase, uh, white sacrifices, uh, white people that you know, can easily be harmed, uh, even killed, uh, for the greater good of the uh, overall white team, the system of white supremacy. So I, I agree completely with that. Mm -hmm. Um, my uh, my co-host uh, Justice, she is also with us. Uh, Justice, if you have some questions that you would like to ask, would uh, do, would you prefer Doctor Les or Doctor Henry? Um, I'd much prefer Doctor Les to Doctor Henry. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Most people just call me Doctor Les anyway. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Or Les, either way, it doesn't matter. Okay, okay. I like to to do uh, confer that respect because you did work hard for that title, um, Doctor Liz. Thanks. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Um, Justice is on the line, my co-host. If you have some questions for uh, Doctor Liz, uh, your line should be open. Please feel free. Hello, Doctor okay. Liz. Greetings. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Do you have a definition of the terms racism and white? supremacy? If so, what are they? Do I have um, definitions of those terms? Yes, and if so, what are they? Ask me the question again, please. Sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Do you have so a definition? what race is... Right. Do I have a term of... Do I have a definition for race? And do I have a definition for white supremacy? Do you have Is a that definition? What you're me? No. For for I I'm yeah. asking. Uh, do you have a definition of the terms racism and white supremacy? If so, what are they? Yeah, I I have yeah I have um, the way I want you to like them. So for instance, race race is um, or racism is a system, it's a system that is based on this idea that there are discrete races amongst the members of the human family. Now that works well to a point, but once you start to actually look into what is race and what does race mean, you see that a lot of those hard, fast classifications go out of the window. So whenever I, I talk about racism, I'm talking about a system that may well be a couple of thousand years old, but the way it's been manifested in the last 600 years and advocated and promulgated by a particular caste of Europeans was for specific purposes. And those purposes, to me, could be captured in one word, and that is domination. It was for the global minority, because whatever, whose account you go by, 
Caucasians, Caucasoids, white-skinned people, if that's how we want to style them, are around 8% of the global population. But if you're in somewhere like Europe or if you're in somewhere like the States, and I know on several occasions when I go to America or, or even parts of the Caribbean, you have this idea that white people, Caucasians, are dominant because you are constantly bombarded with this idea of Caucasians or white people, and this is where white supremacy comes into the picture as well. You're bombarded with this idea that they are the dominant, they are the most intelligent, they are the most sophisticated, they are the most civilized. So you have a system, racism, where they are at the apex and everything else is measured or becomes gradations below that to us as Africans or black people or whatever we want to call ourselves at the bottom. So it would work as white stroke European top, African stroke black bottom. Everything else would be graded in between. That's racism. That's a system. White supremacy works on this notion that there is a discrete group of people on this planet who you can identify as white. However, when you look into the history of white supremacy, especially in the context of where we are in Britain, you can see how problematic it is. So, for instance, white Irish people were not classed as full members of the white family until recently. And there's a series of articles or books or whatever called Race Traitor. And in one of them, there is an article, How the Irish Became White. So remember, if we extracted ourselves as African people out of that framework, in this idea of what white supremacy is, there are acceptable forms of being white and there are unacceptable forms of being white. The only way they don't matter is when other so-called races are in the picture. So that's how I think about racism as a system and white supremacy, white supremacy as a system that reinforces this notion that white is right and everything else isn't. Did that take care of your question? Absolutely. Um, I read that you attended a school that used to be called Samuel Pepe's and that racist white supremacists called the school Sambo Pete. Yeah. What did the white and That's non-black right. students who attended school there say about the school's nickname, Sambo Pete? Well, first we have to kind of put it in context. The school was named after um, a famous British or English poet called Samuel Pepys. And they used to call the school Sambo Peeps, and um, yeah, I wrote about it, about the school. But you've got to put it in the context of the late 1960s. And in the late 1960s in the UK, they were free with these words. And I don't know if, if people on your station will get upset, but they were free to use the words nigger, negro, wog, coon, spade, sambo, they would just call us these things. They were almost like epithets a, a lot of the time. So for them to call our school Sambo Peeps at that time during the late 60s, it wasn't a big deal. It was almost like saying it's a black school because there was this notion that um, the majority of the pupils who went to that school were black, which wasn't in fact true. What it was was there was a high percentage of black um, boys who went to that school, Africans, African Caribbeans, and a, and a few Southeast Asians as well. So you had this visible presence in the school, and that's why they called it that name. But if you put it in its historical context, it didn't mean anything to us at school, black boys or white boys, if they called it that that name, because white boys used to call it that as well. Hello. Uh, yes. Um, I'm going to read uh, some some information about you, and then uh, I'm going to maybe uh, ask some questions about it. From, uh, okay. from your work, Dr. Henry has diagnosed some of the biggest obstacles facing young black youth today is the problem of people not knowing 
what they're being educated for and not grasping the fundamentals of education, as well as lackluster parenting. Some black parents don't take on the mantle of the responsibility of raising their child, wrongly keeping that responsibility onto the teacher. Some kids, children, think they can they some kids think that they can resurrect their life in college even after performing poorly in school. They don't understand the educational relationship. He also points to an increasing acceptance by black pe- by black young people that being stupid is cool. In my day, the 1970s, I was determined to appear smart in school. Now it's the other way. Some among black youth, unfortunately, seem to reveal in being seen as stupid and underachieving. Sometimes these children don't know what they're being educated for. What are the black youth being educated for? Right. What I, what I say to put that in a context, and I, I say this all, all the time, because at the moment we are involved. That's New Beyond and, and another um, organization, Positive Mental Attitude Community College. We're involved in endeavoring to set up an independent school. But whereas a lot of people say we need black schools or we need this or we need that, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that what we need is we need schools of excellence because why I think a lot of the a lot of the people who commentate on the educational system in the u k why I think it's a bit wrong headed is because they work from this premise that the educational system was set up to fail black children or African children or African Caribbean children, and it wasn't. The educational system in the U.K. was set up to fail white working-class people. It was set up when we weren't in their minds or their consciousness. That's when that system was established. So the fact is, if attacks on the educational system focus on the fact that there is an absence of black or African representation in the curriculum, I personally think that is wrong. What we need to do is we need to focus on why is it that a lot of the children are being educated away from themselves. They don't see anything positive reflected about themselves in the curriculum. So, for instance, if I go into a school to do a session with black students, the first thing I will ask them is, what are they doing in school? Why do they think they're in school? Why do they go to school every day? And most of them cannot answer that fundamental question. And it may sound ludicrous and it may sound preposterous, but a lot of them cannot understand that question. And the reason they can't understand that question is because people don't often explain the importance of, one, understanding politically the the society you're in, two, understanding culturally the society you're in, and three, understanding racially how all of those things will place you, they will structurally place you in any given society in the Western world. So, for instance, a lot of the black students will mess around in class, embrace what I call the culture of being dumb, and I remember hearing Public Enemy and many other rap groups talking about that in the 80s, And that's what actually influenced me to to use that term. But they embrace this idea that being dumb is being smart. What they don't realize is when they go through the educational system and they leave school at 16 with no formal qualifications, for many of them, they almost think that they're guaranteed a place at a college, which I believe in, in the States you call it high school. The fact is... When I ask them this question, the reason why I ask them that question is because when I was at school, I never really understood what I was doing there. I've got a twin brother. My twin brother was always academically excellent, 
as was I until I got to about 15 years old. And the fact was, if you had asked me when I was 15, what am I doing at school? I may well have said I'm here to get some qualifications, but to do what with them? Because no one explained to me that the way how this society, not just this society, because I know it speaks to the position and the condition of people in the U.S. as well, it's structured in layers. So to go from, or levels, let's say, to go from one level to another, you need a piece of paper. From the day you're born in these societies, you have a piece of paper. It can be your birth certificate, whatever. But there is always these pieces of paper. Now, no one explained to me, which is what I explained to these young people, when you're in secondary school, you are compelled to be educated from the age of five to the age of 16. It's compulsory. Even if you withdraw your children and educate them at home, it's still compulsory. For those 11 years of your life, I think it would be in your best interest to leave that school with the pieces of paper you need that will guarantee you can go to the next level. The next level may be into employment, or it may be to go to college, which will then take you to university. For many of the young people, they don't make that link. They think that they are almost guaranteed a place at college, or they, if, if they're thinking about going to college or thinking about going to university, it's almost like there is this unrealistic idea that they can achieve those things without having those pieces of paper in place. So the emphasis for me is put on those pieces of paper and what they say at the end of each particular leg of your journey. However, what happens to a lot of the African Caribbean children or black children is they have this, or a lot of um, African-centered scholars or African-centered activists have this idea that all aspects of African history should be if, if, as if you could teach all aspects of African history. But as if these aspects of African history are the main reason why these young people aren't achieving because they don't see themselves represented positively within that which they are being instructed. I don't necessarily go along with that. I think that Young people should know exactly what it is they're doing in school. Now, if you're sent to school in a white-dominated society, in a society that is inherently racist, classist, and sexist, a society where you know that you can watch the TV on any of the main TV channels and you will not see yourself positively represented on there unless you happen to be white, for me, you need to go to school with that vision, that view, that lens, so that you know that what you are being taught is for a particular purpose. And the purpose is this piece of paper with these qualifications. The things you need to know about yourself as an African person or a Jamaican person or whatever, you're not going to get that in school. And why would a dominant society want to give you that information when you will use that information to overturn them? They're not going to do it in that formal education space. So that is something that you need to either seek for yourself or find the places where that information is being provided. That is not the job of your enemy. And the educational system is the enemy of the people, especially African people. And I think that when we look at it like that, there is no confusion on our relationship in there. Between myself and my wife, we have put our children and we've mentored many other children through the educational system. And one of the things that I know with my own children, what I tell them straight, I tell them the pitfalls I went through in this educational system I say to them, you know that you're not going to go there to learn about yourself as an African person or a black person. That is not their job. That is my job. What your job is, is to go in there and achieve what your potential is within that space so that then you can get that piece of paper and move on to another level. You're not in there to learn about yourself as an African. And the, the best example I can give you on that is there is a program that is being screened on Channel 4 in the UK 
every Sunday, and it's by this guy, I believe he's a Harvard professor, a guy called Niall Ferguson. Professor Niall Ferguson, supposedly one of the most, one of the top most influential academics on this planet. Right now he's doing a series, and, and people who are listening, please look it up. It's on the internet. Go to Channel 4, look up Niall Ferguson. The program is called Civilization is the West History. If you watch that program, for me, and I wrote, I wrote to, the, to the head of history at Channel 4, didn't hear anything from him, and I put it up on their website, and I wrote a little blog on it as well. The program is the most racist program I have ever seen. And the reason why it's so racist is because there is no one on this planet is going to tell me that that professor doesn't know the other side of the story that he's presented as truth that he is presenting as truth. If you want to see white supremacists fought in action, watch that program. It is one of the most one-sided so-called history programs I have ever experienced. Now, here is my point. If this is what we're getting on mainstream TV, under the banner of intelligent thinking, because this is the little strap line they have during the commercial breaks to promote this program. If this is what we're getting from one of the top so-called professors, what can we expect in the educational arena, like a secondary school, a college, or a university? I think that as African people, as black people, we need to wake up and we need to say, you know what, there's certain things we can expect in these places so that's how we deal with those places. There are certain things that we should expect from ourselves, and that's the business we need to take care of. I think we waste a lot of energy trying to fix a system that doesn't want to be fixed. I'm sorry for going on so long, but it's how I am. What behavior, <clears throat> what behavior do you see in younger people who seem to act like being stupid is cool. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you. I'll give, I can give you so many examples. Oftentimes, I'm called to go into schools where, and it's usually African Caribbean boys, African or African Caribbean boys, and I'm usually called to go into school when at the, when they are usually coming towards the end of year ten, and they're just on the cusp of being excluded. Okay. Now, sometimes when I go in and I work with these boys, so I could give you an example. I worked with a group recently. So they were year 10, they're 15 years old. They've got one formal year of schooling left. Now, when I went into the class, I was working with them. I had about, I think about a dozen I was working with on trying to motivate them into their education, you know, introducing them to aspects of, you know, an African personality that isn't the so-called inferior, just above savage that we generally get through the mainstream media. Now, I was working with some of these boys, and I can tell within a few minutes, the ones who could be exceptional if they applied themselves to learning. Now, to answer your question, what happens in every session is the boys who give me the most trouble are the ones who are the most academically gifted. There was one particular young man that I worked with, and he was just acting like a complete fool to the point where I said to him, you know, if you want to be a clown, I think you should go and take lessons in being a clown. But that's, this classroom is not the place for that kind of behavior. Anyway, after that session, I was speaking to, the, to his teacher, his form tutor, and she, I said to her, where's his report? I want to have a look at his report. Do you know this boy was practically a straight-A student? But because he felt like he had to put on this front to act out this idea of black boys being the most aggressive and least intelligent, he was jeopardizing his academic future. And that's what I'm talking about, because what happens in, in the mainstream media, and I think this is, this is an example that I use. For instance, this week, just Tuesday gone, I was working in a prison in, out of London. 
and it was 50% black boys, 50% white boys. And one of the things what I explained to them is black people on this planet, especially black youth, and I argue this in nearly everything I write, I used to say this in my lyrics and everything, black people are usually used to set particular types of trend, generally around fashion. So it's around fashion, athleticism, sexuality, you know all the old stuff. The danger with a lot of the black youth is, let's say, for instance, they'll see somebody like 50 Cent, okay? Now, 50 Cent is based on a real character called 50 Cent, as I know you, you will be aware of, most of you will be aware of in, in the States. What happens is, a caricature is made of this real gangster called 50 Cent, and it becomes the 50 Cent that we get through the mainstream media. A lot of the black boys in England will act like the 50 Cent who they see on the videos, on TV, whatever. Then you get white boys who act like those black boys who are acting like 50 Cent. The danger is you've got these black boys going around acting out these caricatures so they become a caricature of a caricature. And the difference between them and the white boys who will exhibit the same behavior as them is the white boys will be forced to grow out of it. You can't be 21 in the UK as a white boy and think you can go around acting like 50 cents. No one would employ you. You probably couldn't live anywhere. There would only be certain areas you could live in. You couldn't move in certain crowds. You couldn't even go to certain events. Okay. With a lot of these black boys, they get trapped in that behavior. So whereas they maybe could have aspired to other things or they may even have the intellect or, or whatever cranial capacity to do better for themselves, they get locked into these caricatures and they will go around. I know big men in their 40s who still act out those caricatures. They have their, their, their bottoms hanging out of their trousers. They wear clothes with letters on that I don't even know if they can read. But they're acting out this whole idea of embracing this culture of being dumb, this get rich or die trying, or whatever the attitude is called. And that is what I show to young people because for black people, because we are generally measured by these yardsticks. So, for instance, if you want to see the most educated black people on the planet, I would ask you this question, um, Sister Justice, what country would you look to? Is uh, that a question? It's a question for you. If I say to you, tell me where are the most intelligent black people on this planet, if you wanted to look for the most intelligent black people on this planet, what country would you look to? I am uh, unsure because, um, yeah, this is the, 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 there's the system of white supremacy here, and I don't, um, I am very unsure about that. Right, well, I, I, I can tell you that if you... Country. Right, if you spoke to most people, and maybe it's because you're so close to home, if you said to most people, where are the most intelligent black people found, they will say America. They will point to professors in Harvard or Yale or whatever those white yardsticks are to mention, to, to measure your intellectuality or whatever we want to call it, okay? If I said to you, show me where are the worst representations of black-on-black -black violence in the Western world, and that's the caveat I should have put in there, or that's the disclaimer, in the Western world, and I ask you the question again, people would say Los Angeles or somewhere in America, probably. Okay. Because what happens is we can, we, this is as African people, one of the things that happened to us during chattel enslavement that still impacts on us now, which was absolutely one of the tools of white domination and white supremacist thought and action, was the fact that as black people, as African people, we are absolutely interchangeable. So what this means is you can look to America and you can say, yes, you know, there are black people there who have made it and they're most intelligent. 
Then they'll show you the flip side of the coin, but look at the matter, shooting up each other over colours in whatever, whatever, whatever. So you can have that. But you won't find anywhere on this planet where that is seen as the norm. It will be polar. It will always be on some, some kind of um, polar opposite of extremes. You won't find a middle where it would say, well, you know, the people from this area, they're, they're respectable. The people from this country, they are, they are deemed to be the most intelligent. You won't find that anywhere in African communities. And that is one of the problems, because then when you try to explain to young people, look, to be black doesn't necessarily mean you have to run around being like, being like I don't know, whatever it is, some gangster, some thug, or you have to speak a certain way. But it's hard, because there isn't anywhere on this planet where you could point and say, look, there they are, all Africans, all civilized you get both ends of the spectrum there. You don't really get that. You don't get that yardstick because we will always get the fact that the majority of us, and this is how it works in the mainstream and it's reinforced through, you know, whiteness, that's what I argue, is that we'll say, look at the majority of them. The majority of them have access to education, but they choose to be this. They have access to whatever, but they choose to be this. And these are the things that are reinforced through the media, and these are, the, these are the types that a lot of the black youth, especially in England, are taking up, taking on board and acting out those kinds of what they believe are realities, which culminates now in the fact that they are so quick to do things to each other, which they wouldn't even consider, in most cases, doing to a white person. So you could have black boys will attack each other for just looking at each other. Or I know you in the U.S., you're familiar with them being on the ends or whatever they call it in England. They call it the ends or the manor or whatever. Yeah. But you'll get that. And one of the reasons why you get that is because a lot of these young people, what they are being exposed to, they don't critically engage with it. They don't even test it to see, does that fit me? Does it make sense to me? So what a lot of them do is they just accept these types and they run with them. Hello. What are some of the differences in the education system now from when you attended public school? What are some of the differences? Yes. Did you, so, sorry, did you... What, what are, are some, some of the differences... Yes, well, to me, there aren't, well, to me, there aren't many significant differences, to be honest. There aren't many differences because um, things that could have been included or taught as part of the curriculum aren't. And so, for instance, I know that if you're teaching the history of Elizabethan England, okay, you can teach about the 20,000 Africans who were living in Elizabethan England. So you could talk about the Africans who were living in Elizabethan England who weren't slaves, who were free people, but they won't do that. Now, that information may not have been there when I was at school, but it's definitely there now, but it's not incorporated in the national curriculum. So it goes back to what I was saying about it being deliberate and I think that sometimes we expend a lot of energy trying to alter those things. So if you're asking me what has qualitatively changed in the educational system since I was a child, I would say nothing. I read you were expelled from school and college for fighting. Who did you fight? Were they white or non-white? And what caused the fight? Oh, oh dear. Okay. The first one, I got expelled from school for fighting a teacher. But I have to be honest with you, I've got a twin brother, and we used to fight nearly every day. And one of the things which I do actually like is fighting. And I would be lying if I said to you that the boys who I fought were only white, because they weren't. But if you had to put it on a percentage, if when I was at school I had 100 fights, 95 of them would have been with white boys, without a shadow of a doubt. 
I got expelled from college because um, there were some boys, I think they were Turkish boys, were beating up a friend of mine, and I got involved and got expelled for that. So does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Um, was the people who fought... Wait, you said your brother, right? No, I used to... I've got a twin brother, so that's why I was explaining why I, I fight so often. I actually do martial arts and stuff like that. I do like to fight. I can't lie. Were they white or non-white? Most of the boys, most of the fights I've had in my life, physical fights you're talking about, have been with white people. Absolutely. I haven't oh, had okay. many fights with, with black black boys or black men. I mean... I'm a lot older now, but when I was younger, I would more try and talk my way out of a fight with a black man. But if it was a white man, I wouldn't, because I know the thing with a lot of white boys, and we used to say this, was you'd think that everything was all right, and if you did turn your back, that was it. So I I physically fist fights. I used to have a lot of fist fights with white boys. But where we grew up in southeast London... It was very hostile and very racist. So, for instance, you know, and I talk about this in um, one of the chapters in the in the whiteness book. I talk about the fact that you know we we started to do martial arts when we were fifteen in the early seventies, and the only martial arts you could really do then was um, judo, karate, and a little bit of jujitsu. They weren't teaching kung fu in the UK then. And one of the reasons why we were doing martial arts was because we used to go to this youth center called the Moon the Moonshot Youth Club. And when we went to the youth center, we were being taught black history, as they called it then, or African history. But we also had to do martial arts because the people who were teaching us said, you know, it's all well and good having this knowledge in your head. But when you go out on the street, there's going to be white men out there who want to bust your head open. And the fact is, when I was 15, when I was around 15, 16, we used to get attacked on our way home from school and on our way home from youth clubs by white men. We're talking men probably from the early 20s up to whatever age. So they didn't care about attacking like 13 or 14 year olds and things like that. And even my wife, who came from Jamaica and went to secondary school over here in the UK, even as girls, they used to have to walk in groups because white people would attack us. White people would attack them. White boys and white men would attack them. So we grew up in a generation where I think most of us had to, had to learn to fight or we could fight because we were used to being attacked by white people. And this is um, London I'm talking about, especially southeast London, where I know. Um, I don't have any more questions at this time, so I guess. Okay. Well, give thanks anyway, sis. Give me something to think about. Context of white supremacy. I want to make sure I give out the... Uh web address uh, for both of your sites. Um, you can get more information about uh, Dr. Les, his books, uh, and what he's doing, projects, and all that good stuff. Uh, the web address, www.drles.co.uk, uh, and that would be D as in direct, R as in run, L as in long, E as in energy, Z as in zest, drles.co.uk. Uh, and the address again for uh, New Beyond is newbeyond.com, uh, N-U-B-E-Y-O-N-D. Um, the uh, publication, Whiteness Made Simple, uh, stepping into the gray zone. Uh, I hope people are looking at the photograph. Um, you can see the cover uh, image. Uh, very interesting graphic. Um, I was hoping you could uh, give some of the background information uh, about this photograph. I believe this took place in Canada. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I was in um, I was in uh, Toronto in 1999, and I was with. Uh, in fact, I was with one of my nieces, and we were walking down Young Street. And I remember I was I was going to go and buy something. I can't remember what we were doing down there, but I was on my way to a shop anyway. And when I was walking down the road, I got accosted by this white guy who was dressed up in these, you know, these Roman togas, these like, these white robes that they always have um, Jesus in. And I've always found it ironic that if they're, if they're Jesus, the one that, you know, we're given to believe in, the European Jesus, uh, it baffles me as to why he would wear a Roman toga and stuff like that, but there you go. But this guy um, was dressed up in this white, whatever it is, outfit. And when I was walking past him with my niece, he looked at me. And because I've got dreadlocks, you know, and I didn't have a wedding ring on at the time. So he looked at me and he said, fornicator. So I looked at him. I said, excuse me. And he started to say stuff about, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I said to him, look, I'm just going to go to the shop. I soon come back. Yeah. I said, I'll be back. So anyway, I went to the shop and, and I said to my niece, I gave her my camera and I said to her, just go over there and take some pictures of me reasoning with Jesus and watch Jesus' demeanor change. So I went up to him and I, I said to him, yeah, you were saying something. And, you know, he started explaining to me, you know, because he, he obviously thought the young lady was my daughter, which she wasn't. So he put, you know, dreadlocks, child, rasta, together, child born out of wedlock, blah, blah, blah. You know, he, he jumped to his own conclusions. But curiously enough, when I was reasoning with him, I kept asking him, why are you dressed like that? Are you Jesus? And he wouldn't answer the question. He just started to get more and more irate. And he was trying to give me some information he was giving out and trying to quote certain things from the Bible, you know, certain verses or scriptures or whatever. And what I kept saying to him was, why are you dressed like that? Are you Jesus? And he couldn't answer the question until the point where he got so angry, he was hurling all these things at me, you know, what what has happened to me and, you know, the usual stuff. But he could not answer that fundamental question. Why is he dressed like that? Is he Jesus? He couldn't even tell me he was a representation of Jesus. So the last thing that I left him with was, I'm sure that someone in that book that you're waving at me, it says, don't worship graven images. And I said, that is exactly what you are. So the reason why I chose to put that on the front of my book is because I think it encapsulates everything I wanted to argue about whiteness. Because the fact is, what whiteness does is it not only whitens the world and all the people in it of note, historically and contemporaneously as well. What it does is it obscures the fact that there is a minority on this planet who control the majority of the world's resources and they will do anything to ensure that they maintain that stranglehold. And the best way to do it is by colonize, colonizing people's minds and their consciousness. And one of the greatest tools for colonizing people's minds and consciousness has been those white images of Jesus. Because what that does is, especially if you are not white and you are not a European, the first thing it's telling you is, this is God, this is what God looks like. If you want to be like God, you need to be like this. But there's a problem. You can't really be like God. So how are you going to get near to God? Well, the nearest you can get to God is to act like the people who tell you they are the representations of God. And therefore, you shun everything about yourself that would locate yourself in a consciousness, a community, a so-called race, or whatever. And you compromise that or you suppress that 
sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. But what that does is it locks you into this 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 thought pattern that <coughs> anything white is good and anything that isn't is bad. And that comes by virtue of that image. That's why you can I do sessions where I'll show people that image. In fact, one of the talks I do around the book is I'll show people that image and I'll say to people, who is that? Now, the smart ones will say, oh, it's Michelangelo or it's Warner Sal Salman's image or, you know, originally it was Zeus and then they turned him into Jesus. And they will say all this wonderful stuff. But I will say to them, when did you learn that? And if I asked you this question 20 years ago, who would you have told me that was? Then they will admit that they said, they would have said, it was Jesus. Because if you're in the Western world, it is very hard for you not to equate that image with Jesus. And remember, where I am in, in, in Britain is a Christian country. It's supposedly under the banner of the Church of England. And at the head of the Church of England is or are these white pictures, plural, of this Jesus type figure. So you imagine that from an early age, all you've been taught is that this is the true likeness of the Son of God. Therefore, by logical extension, you're not. How are you going to come to terms with that? Because just by getting a bit of knowledge that the picture was taken from, I don't know, Juan or Salman, because I believe his one is the most popular one, that in and of itself isn't going to enable you to divest of all the other things that are attached to that image. And to me, that's why I chose that image and put it on the front of my book, because I wanted people to, I wanted people to be sure that what I am arguing in this book may be unpalatable for some people, but for me, it's a conversation that we, especially as black people or African people or African Caribbeans or Afro-Brazilians, whatever we want to call ourselves, we need to have that conversation. Context of white supremacy, uh, our guest live from the UK, Dr. William Les Henry. Um, in Whiteness Made Simple, um, this book, uh, it says, is an attempt uh, to separate white people from white supremacist thought and action. Uh, can you deconstruct what that means, separating white people from white supremacist thought and action? Yeah, because um, it, it, it kind of goes back to the beginning of the program when you asked me about, um, you know, when you offered the definition of what white supremacy is. Because I think one of the failings that happens, especially in the UK, is a lot of black people, African people, just assume that all white people are in positions of power, which is not the case. You know, we have to be cute enough to, to, to overstand, as Rastafari says, so and not understand and overstand, okay? We have to be cute enough sometimes to think about what is at stake in this conversation because the conversation isn't just about white people dominating the planet to the detriment of all people who aren't white that's not what the problem is the problem for me is they've created a system that if they vanished from the planet tomorrow let's say something happened and all the white people vanished tomorrow morning another group could take over that system and us as black people or African people could be in exactly the same position as we're in today. So it's a system. It was created and manifested out of some kind of hatred that I can't even fathom by these racist Europeans at a particular moment designed for a particular purpose. But if they vanished, the system could still maintain itself. Because you only have to think about, if you've got, let's say, for instance, you're, you're in, I don't know, Jamaica. And Jamaica was a colony. 
And Jamaica, no matter how much Jamaicans want to go on, they still have a white consciousness that governs their behavior. So their political systems and all of those things, their judiciary, they still have to answer to Eng the, what, what happens in Britain. Because I believe you can still hang people in Jamaica under British law, but you can't hang people in Britain under British law. That's how whiteness works. So at the end of the day, you can have all black people in a so-called all-black country and they're still operating according to white rules and white norms and white values. So to me, we need to think about what whiteness is as a system and not just equate it with white people. Because, yes, they're in positions of power now and dominance and, you know, dominate the planet through whatever means. But at the end of the day, people get confused because then how can you explain that you could have a country like South Africa, which openly stated and advocated its hatred of us as African people, but some of the laws were enforced by Africans against themselves who fully knew that they weren't even recognized as human in the same system they were enforcing. The system has to be beyond people. Hmm, that's interesting. I guess my what I, the way I would explain uh, how the system of white supremacy operated in the area of the world known as South Africa, um, once you have a people subject to you, it's very easy uh, for you to get people that are subject to you to help you further mistreat other individuals. Uh, I think Absolutely. That, that's uh that's easily demonstrated. So I think those those individuals in South Africa, the black people uh who were harming other black people to help maintain white supremacy, so called apartheid, um, that's that's to be expected. Um I would say that they're still victims and I don't think that uh I don't think that in any way nullifies that that at the end of the day white people are most responsible for that too. Does that oh, make sense? Absolutely. Oh. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they are not responsible because they created the system and they own it. You know, they don't even act like they didn't create it. You go and do any course on, you know, philosophy or, or sociology or whatever, and they'll, t they'll tell you about the Enlightenment philosophers. You know, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of spookism and mysticism around this mysterious Illuminati, and, you know, if people want to go down that road, that's up to them. I just say, go and read about the, the Enlightenment philosophers, because... What many of them were arguing, people like Descartes, they argued that there are groups who should rule, and those groups were white. So therefore, what manifests out of them would be the subjugation of anything that they didn't consider to be human, based on whatever yardsticks they used to measure that humanity, and those yardsticks were always couched in whiteness. So I don't have any problems with that. But the point that I'm trying to make is, you know, we have to be careful because otherwise we will think that there are black people or African people who act out of, act out white supremacist agenda out of this idea of victimhood. Some of them don't do it for victimhood. They do it through capital gain. Just like there were Africans who were involved in the chattel enslavement period they were involved in chattel slavery and many of them were fully aware of what was happening to their brothers and sisters in the americas across the caribbean and other places so i think that we have to be honest with ourselves as african people and say that yes many of us are victims and remember the, the fact is that probably i don't know what percentage but a high percentage of these people of the people on this planet don't want to think for themselves. They want other people to think for them. I think that is just a human condition. But there are those who are in positions who absolutely do know better than what is coming out of their mouth. And just look at the U.S. government. Look at the previous U.S. government. Look at the black figures who are, who are in there and see what comes out of their mouth. Don't tell me they don't know better because they see the world. They see more of the world than we ever will. So something happens, there is something about the system that overrides your basic humanity. 
And that, for me, is what the problem is. Because I don't believe any human beings are born as babies and the first thing that they know is to hate. I don't believe that. It's learned. I think it is learned behavior. So, for me, it's always problematic if we're going to just have this clear-cut dichotomy and say, victims, innocents. Because it's more blurred than that. And I think that um, I know many African people or black people who know, have the information, but really don't care. And one of the things that people often say to me is, you know what, Les, I only live once. You can't guarantee when I'm going to die. So I want to live this kind of life now. And I don't really care who I hurt or who I injure. It doesn't bother me. Because you can't guarantee me not one extra day on this planet. You cannot guarantee breath. So I think that when we have these conversations, we need to be very clear on the ones who know and act according to what they know because they serve a different master or interest and the ones who do it just out of flagrant ignorance because it's quite different. Um, my uh, my logo uh, here at the program context of white supremacy is the problem is white people, um, and I, I believe that firmly uh, worldwide. The problem is white people, um, and I wanted to ask: Are you familiar with the work of Dr. Frances Cress Welsing? Uh, she published the book The ISIS Papers, and uh, yeah, I used her in my I teach a, a media course, Introduction to the Race and Media on Ted Live Vision, and uh, we we used um, Cress Welsing two weeks ago. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, I do teach out of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, she's been a guest on the program several times, and I think uh, I think her theory is is solid. I think she's correct uh, in uh, her theory of white genetic annihilation, and uh, I think if there is a system worldwide uh, of white supremacy. Uh, where and you said yourself, white people, tiny percentage of the population uh, worldwide, uh, for a small percentage uh, of people to dominate a large number of people. Uh, I just think it makes logical sense to be uh, very suspicious uh, of every white person, and uh, I don't think uh, it's to non-white people's best interest. African people worldwide, black people worldwide. I don't think it's to our best interest uh, to look for white people that, hey, maybe they don't have as much money, maybe they don't have as much power to say, well, you know, these people, they're being mistreated too. I don't think it's it's in our best interest uh, because at the end of the day, if they are white, that means a whole lot anywhere you are on this planet. Uh, does that, does what I'm saying, does that make sense? It makes sense to me up to a point, but you see, there's two things going on there because I liked um, what, Francis Chris Wilson wrote, but I think that it needs to be updated. There are bits of it that need to be updated. And, I, and one of the things that I find with a lot of, um, you know, African centered or Afrocentric critique is people don't want to think about other variables that come into play. So, for instance, I agree with what you're saying about. White, um, su- um, white survival and genetic annihilation, and I do agree with that aspect of what Francis Cress Welsing said. Because if you look at any any living organism on this planet, the thing what they want to do is survive. And if they see themselves as a species, then it's to make their species survive. So I don't really have a problem with that. What my problem is is with the majority of white people that I come into contact with don't actually know they're not the the majority on this planet. They don't know that. Because if you, if I I know for a fact that when I watch the news in the UK, you will never hear them say, we Europeans are the global minority. I've never heard them say that, ever. Not even in the programs that they show, their documentaries, their current affairs, nothing. They don't push that information out there. Niall Ferguson? Does, is Niall Ferguson, I thought, his civilization coming to an end? Isn't that, uh, does that qualify? Well, he doesn't do it that way. He's very. I only watched the first one because I can't really put too much of that crazy stuff in my head sometimes. But in the first one, he didn't do that. What he did was he was very careful with the way he used figures and numbers. 
But the point that I'm making is the only whites who I hear talk about them being a minority are the white extremists because they use it in a way to mobilize whoever it is they want to listen to them. But the fact is, most ordinary white people don't know that they are the global minority. And I know when I do sessions with young people especially, I've, listen, I've, let, me, let me tell you this. Yeah. In the UK, African, African, Caribbean, I think if there are a million and a half of us left in the UK now, there's a lot out of 62 million people. Because what they do is they look at the UK and they'll say there are 7 million minorities or whatever, but they put Australians, Irish, you know, Croatians, everybody will be chucked into that mix. So let's say there are 1.5 million African, African, Caribbean people in the UK, and this is being generous, okay? If you speak to most, especially a lot of the white people in London, they actually think that African, African, Caribbean people are the majority in London, and a lot of African, African, Caribbean people I've spoken to, especially a lot of young people in schools, they actually think we are the dominant in the UK because it is in someone's interest to have that kind of confusion going on. To me, when we talk about genetic annihilation, if we're going to argue that all the white people on the planet or the majority of the white people on the planet want to dominate, suppress, subjugate all the other people on this planet because they're afraid of genetic annihilation, then I think we need to think about how many of them are even aware of that. Because they're, they're fed, the ordinary white people are fed the same kind of information as we are. And that is, we look at the TV, they're dominant. We look in the press, they're dominant. They show us a history where they're dominant. So if we're going to keep, if we're all going to be bombarded with that, then I think we need to have different kinds of conversations. And the other thing as well about, um, you know, white people and being suspicious of white people, we should be suspicious of anybody who can invest in, in power and privilege that is their birthright. We should be suspicious of anybody. So I agree with your point on that, because to me, if you want to understand how white privilege works, just look at the monarchy or the royal family, and I'll tell you straight, I ain't got no time for no royalty. I don't care what color skin they come in. I don't respect none of you. I think that if we're going to say that as human beings we're born equal, how can people be born unequal just because they're supposedly royal and they get the royal treatment? But if you want to see how whiteness works, think about any royal family and the privilege they have just for being born. That's how whiteness works. So because the system was created by white racist Europeans, it privileges those who are classified as white. The fact is, a lot of white people don't even recognize that. So for instance, I'll give you an example. When I was younger, this was when I was, I don't know, in my late teens, early 20s, if I was walking down the streets in London and a white person asked me for money, begged me for money, I would never give them money. The reason I wouldn't give them money was because even then I realized this system is set up in your favor. So if you as a white person don't recognize that you're white and everything is tipped in your favor, that's your problem. It's not mine. So on things like that, I'm very clear and I'm very plain. I just think that we need to have a different kind of conversation because especially the world as it is being shaped now, for us as African people, if we don't start thinking about ways to deal with the system, as, as, as Amos N. Wilson said, peace be upon him, years ago, we will we need to be careful that we don't change one slave master for another. And I think that is the danger in sometimes just focusing on white people. Because, yes, they're the major problem to the planet now, and I think most people who've got even one eye half open can see that. But at the end of the day, they're not the only danger to the survival of us as African people, and the clearest example of that is look at who's buying up half of the Caribbean 
and Africa. So I think that we need to we need to have some different kinds of in house conversations about what if we're going to say that as 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 a nation, whether we are the original people on the face of the planet Earth or not. But if we intend to survive as a nation, then we need to think about what is that survival going to be based on because it's fair enough to resist, but we need to start transcending our conditions because you can resist until you're tired and then you keel over and die. But when you transcend, you're looking beyond that. You're looking to think, okay, this is what we do after we overcome this obstacle. And to me, whiteness, white supremacist thought and action is an obstacle, even by their own measurements and the things they say. And I mean, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was not no, no foaming at the mouth radical, said it in, I think it was the ABC of Color, that, you know, white people, Caucasians or whatever we call them in the book, know that they are facing genetic annihilation. It's not, it's not a new concept. But I think that we, if we're going to say, as African people, we would still like to have a viable presence on this planet in 200 years' time, we need to think beyond just focusing on white people as the enemy. Because they may, they may well manifest as the enemy now, but what happens if in 100 years or 150 years they're more or less gone, which by their own projections could well come to pass? Who will be the enemy of African people then? That's why, for me, we need to broaden the discussion. We have uh, 13 minutes left in the broadcast. I want to make sure I get to uh, your report okay. on uh, homophobia. Um, but before I do, I did. I just wanted this as a matter of record. Uh, it is reported here that uh, Niall Ferguson has a book out, Civilization, the West, and the Rest. Uh, this is also, uh, I think, the Channel 4 series is based on this. So this That's seems right. yeah. uh, pretty yeah. uh, explicit. Uh, and he also has a post where he uh, is talking about the decline uh, of the West. Uh, so it seems it seems very explicit. Um, I did want to ask, uh, you talked about your, uh, I've seen you in videos talking about your offspring. Uh, is your partner, is she also an African or black female? Absolutely, yes. She's Jamaican, black Jamaican woman, yeah. Okay. Just check Absolutely. It. Groovy. I read your uh, blog post, uh, and for folks out there, uh, if you want to uh, kind of keep tabs on what Dr. Les uh, writes, you can go to his blog, and it's uh same address but at uh, WordPress. Um, in fact, I'll give you the address in one second. I'll give. Oh, it's linked. I did my job. It's linked. Uh, the address yeah, is drles.wordpress.com. There you go. Drles. D r l e z. dot wordpress. dot com. And if you click homophobia, it'll take you to the specific report uh, that I'm referencing. Uh, and I found this really interesting. This seems to be a global trend. Uh, can you talk about uh, your struggles and uh, problems around the word? Uh, homophobia? Well, I can, but the first thing I want to say about um, we're close with Niall Ferguson, to show you how how devious this man is, or clever, he t he's taken the title from his book, from Chin Wezu's book, The West and the Rest of Us. Just, 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 people just need to be mindful of that, because there is this idea that, you know, sometimes, um, white professors or whatever right out of a position of ignorance so they're almost forgiven so i think people just need to be mindful of that the homophobia thing hmm, very interesting i just know that from the first time i heard that word bandied about i had a major problem with it and then when i returned to academia and was studying anthropology you know it just the whole thing didn't make any sense because and for um homophobia homo as of the genus human homo or man and phobia fear so the word means you're afraid of men or fear of men well i ain't afraid of men so then i had a with that word so I started to think about it and what that word is is it's one of those words where people just accept its meaning but don't interrogate what it actually means what does it refer to so you know
know, one of the ones, um, a good one would be like, if you, if you say to somebody, what is inflation? And they're going to say, oh, when the government puts up money. Well, no, inflate just means to inflate. You can blow something up. You can pump something up. It's inflation. But what we do is we take on the popular meaning of a word, and oftentimes we don't actually interrogate the meaning of the word. And this for me is absolutely what has happened with homophobia and why people are, having, are afraid to have debates around what homosexuality is. And in fact, when the reason why I wrote that article was because in 2005, I believe it was 2005, when you had this, this group, this homosexual um, group called Outrage, with this guy, Peter Touch, who goes around the world trying to arrest people like Robert Mugabe and whatever. He won't go and arrest George Bush, but he would try and go and arrest, you know, Mugabe or anyone who he says is homophobic. Now, what happened in the UK was some people in Jamaica, some homosexuals or pro-gay groups in Jamaica, started to talk about um, Jamaican DJs and their so-called homophobic lyrics, anti-gay lyrics, whatever, whatever. So every year I usually do a, a talk for my local borough or council and for the Black History Month, and we have Black History Month in October. Cut a very long story short, I talk about this in the Whiteness book. In 2005, I said I would do a talk on um, this homophobia, and I was going to call the talk, I called the talk, Outrage Us, Boom Bye Bye to Freedom of Speech. Because one of the first tunes to spark this homophobic, you know, Jamaicans especially are the most homophobic people on the planet, was Buja Banton's tune, Boom Bye Bye, when he spoke about them murdering homosexuals or gay men in Jamaica. So I wanted to have this public lecture Lewisham Council banned my lecture without consulting me. The only way I knew that the lecture wasn't going ahead was it wasn't in the booklet that they promote the Black History Month with. When I tried to have a conversation with people from the council, I couldn't even have that conversation with them because all it was was, oh, you're going to offend particular groups in the community. And I'm saying which group? And they wouldn't say homosexual men or gay men, or lesbian women. They just would say particular groups. So one of the things what I argue in that article is I say, and this used to happen to me when I was a lecturer at um, this university at Goldsmiths College. I used to teach sociology there. And I noticed that whenever it came to this idea of sexuality, you couldn't say, you, I, I, not you couldn't, you weren't expected to say, well, I'm not a homosexual, and I don't sleep with men. I sleep with women. In fact, they used to get upset because I said to them, every woman I've ever had is an African woman. That is my particular choice and preference. Why can't I say that, oh, you're being racist? Well, actually, I'm not. It's my preference. Why can't I say that? So what used to happen was they have these conversations around homosexuality, and this is what I would say, and I will say on your show, for the record, I don't really care if a man wants to sleep with another man. That's his business. I don't really care if a woman wants to sleep with another woman. That's her business. What I care about is when somebody's trying to tell me I must accept that behavior as normal or natural to me. It isn't. I am not God or the goddess or the creator. The only thing I know is what is natural for me is to have a woman. That is what is natural for me. Because then logically, if we're both able and we have the blessing, we can create, we can procreate. If you think that it is natural for you to be a homosexual and to have a man as your partner or to be a homosexual woman, a lesbian, and have a woman as your partner, that's up to you. It may well be natural to you. It's not natural to me. This is usually where the problems come up. Because for a lot of homosexuals, they want 
other people to accept their lifestyle as natural and normal to them. And to me, that is what is wrong with those conversations. And that is what is wrong with these things about homophobia. You just have to say anything and you're homophobic. You just have to say, it's a bit like anti-Semitism. I want somebody to explain to me, how can an Arab be an anti-Semite when Arabs and Jews are Semites? How does it work? The reason why it works is because people close off rational and reasonable conversations. And that's why people can say what they want about me with regards to homosexuality, but I will say it, and I say it all the time. I am an African man, and I know that I have never found any African groups who say that homosexuality is natural. I'm not saying homosexuality doesn't occur on the continent, because that would be ridiculous. What I am saying is, I don't know where it's on such public display and acceptable on the continent. And for me, the continent, as an African person, has to be my mother. In fact, if you were in the UK, there is a very peculiar advertisement that is running on the TV for a bookmaker, and I won't even call the name of the bookmaker, but there is a very peculiar advert. It is running on mainstream TV in the UK, and I'm going to actually write something on my blog about it next week. But on this advert, you've got a white man and a white woman, and they're kind of in this kind of amorous exchange, of, and they're talking about a mobile phone. Then a guy comes on, he takes the phone away from the man, advertises the product he's advertising. Then the next thing you see is him caressing the man while the woman is... So you've got this man has gone behind the man caressing this other man who is caressing this woman. What the hell is that about? If that isn't promoting homosexuality, what is it? And that is on mainstream TV channel during the day, during the night. You tell me what that's about. Somebody has an agenda to normalize something, a bit like what happened in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome, and people aren't brave enough to have that conversation. Well, I am, and I do. And until somebody convinces me what it means to be homophobic, I will never accept that label. Uh, we had a uh, person that called in uh, really quick. Uh, do you have time to get a question before uh, we wrap up? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the person that dialed in nine zero one six uh, nine zero one six. Did you have a question for Doctor Liz? What? What? Um, picking up a lot of background noise. Uh, if you have a question, uh, if you could kind of get a quiet spot so you could ask your question, that would be great. Uh, person at nine zero one six. Did you have a question? I'll try one more time. Nine zero one six. Uh, 9016, did you have a question? Okay, I will assume they're just listening. Uh, the other folks that are on the line, if you have a question, if you could, there we go, 5590, 5590, did you have a question for Dr. Liz? Uh, person in 5590, did you have a question? Oh, my bad, I had my phone muted. Um, hello to the doctor, you just you justice and Gus. Can I be heard? Yes, greetings. I can hear you. Hello. Okay. Um, I asked a guest that was from the UK on there one time before about um Brixton. And I was wondering if you had any information on what's happening in Brixton and what happened to Brixton. Um, Brixton to be honest is just like any other place in London. It used to be a kind of a center and a hub for um, the African Caribbean community, but after certain amounts of gentrification, it's not so central. I mean, Brixton is still vibrant, but um, it's not what it was in the 80s, so that's the only way I can answer that question, really. It's just another in, um, London borough where, or, or another area within a London borough where, where um, you've got African Caribbean people. 
All right, um, thank you. Oh, and one thing also, I turned on the uh, news this morning, and I see that they're raising some hell over there in uh, Britain this morning. What's going on with that? They raided some what, sorry? They seem like there's some protesting going on this morning over there. Oh, yeah, yeah, this yeah, morning? they're protesting against the um, student fees because the government has, um, basically they're trying to price, you know, ordinary people, working class or whatever we want to call it, they're trying to price, price them out of the, educational system so they don't go to university so they're doing all these kinds of cuts but you would expect that from um, a government especially like the one that we've got in now uh, thank you for the question there was one other person uh, that called in with a hand up did, uh, did you have time for that last question I do yeah no worries okay a uh, person that dialed in from a blocked number, uh, your line is open. Did you have a question for Dr. Les? Just listening. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Groovy. Um, I want to make sure I give out the uh, web address again so people can support um, Dr. Les, his uh, personal website, uh, www.drlesdr.com. L E Z dot C O dot U K and uh New Beyond uh the website new N U B E Y O N D dot com New Beyond and these are all linked at the website. If you click his name that'll take you to his website. If you click New Beyond that'll take you to the New Beyond website. And uh you can get his blog if you click uh the word homophobia, it'll take you to his blog and uh you can look out for the brand new post that should be coming out this week. Um thoroughly enjoyed having you uh on the program. Um oh uh, different person uh, called in. Uh, do you have time for me to check this last line to see if they have a question? Yeah, I've got a couple. Of, I've got a couple of minutes here. Okay. Uh, person that dialed in four four zero four 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 zero four. Did you have a question for Doctor Liz? Yes, sir. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you uh, for, for being on the program, Doctor Liz. I think I saw um, something that you. That that was referring to you in regards to, I guess, promoting the idea or something with economics and Black Wall Street. Um, if that's accurate, if you can just give more information about, you know, I guess uh, what you intend or want to do uh, in regards with non-white people or black people in uh, economics, uh, I guess, in regards to Black Wall Street. Um, I think what it was, we we for one of our Black Fridays, we no no. I'll tell you what, what that probably was. I did, I did a talk at um, University of Oklahoma uh, about three years ago, I think. A sister called Dr. Makeda Graham invited me over there when she was based there. And I visited the Black Wall Street, so I think it may be something around that. But I haven't got anything specifically programmed um, to deliver on the Black Wall Street. Okay, okay, and then I saw okay. something you guys were going to be showing the uh, uh, documentary uh, Blood, Blood I Go Run, or something like that. Um, I just yeah, thought yeah. you had a, of, a, a place to uh, yeah, where what it others, was, we, yeah, where we, others we, could we view that documentary or find access. Yeah. Yeah, do so you know where that video is located? Do you know where that video could be located by anyone else who wanted to view it? Yes. Um, I'll tell you the, the best thing to do. If you email me, okay, I'll give you an email. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's just info, I-N-F-O, at um, newbeyond.com, N-U-B-E-Y-O-N-D.com. If you um, email me, I should be able to, to sort that out. But I think it's on YouTube. If you if you go to YouTube and put in blood ah uh, G I'm sorry blood B L W O D R A H go go run it should come up because the film is about um, a big march that we had 30 years ago when we had 14 young people died in a fire in New Cross and then we had the Brixton uprisings so we had an event on March the second to commemorate that. So that's probably what you're referring to there. And in fact, the lecture for that event, the 
presentation, in fact, thinking about it now, you can probably see the documentary. If you go to the New Beyond website, www.newbeyond.com, mm-hmm. on the events page, there's a Ustream link. You can watch the talk on Ustream. And I know Blood of Run is shown during that session. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir. No, give thanks. Appreciate the call. Appreciate that. I hope uh, folks listening uh, will check out those sites. I, I might want to check out that video myself. Uh, if it's on YouTube, I will make some time to do so. Um, yeah. Thoroughly enjoyed uh, having you on the program, Dr. Les. I hope people will uh, check out the book, uh, Whiteness Made Simple, uh, and your earlier book, uh, What the DJ Said, A Critique from the Street. Um, Thank you again for uh, spending some of your Saturday afternoon. Uh, We would love to have you back on the program to continue the dialogue. Anytime. Anytime at all. And I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And all I would say is stay blessed, stay focused, and keep up the good works. We will. We will do our best, sir. Uh, Continue to enjoy your weekend and keep up the outstanding work. Uh, We will be in touch with you soon. Um, Yeah, just take care, and and we'll we'll be in touch soon. Okay, we'll give thanks. Have a a blessed day. Thank you, sir. Bye. Have a great evening. Bye-bye, sis. Hold that. Good evening. Context of white supremacy. Uh, Again, our guest uh, from the United Kingdom, Dr. William Les Henry. Um, in the middle of quite a stretch here, context of white supremacy this weekend, uh, going around the context or the confines of the plantation, uh, our guest yesterday, uh, Majamite Jaboro, uh, joined us live from Nigeria. I guess today live from the United Kingdom, and tomorrow, that would be Sunday, March 27th, uh, our guest will be Dr. Ann Patel Gray. Uh, She'll be joining us live from Australia uh, to discuss her book, The Great White Flood, Racism in Australia. Should be very constructive. Her book is outstanding. Um, She uses the term white supremacy frequently, and she does reference non-white people in Australia as black, which was kind of surprising. Uh, I believe uh, Dee from uh, Reckless 2.0 here at Blog Talk Radio, he uh, called the program yesterday, and I believe he inquired about that, and she has been, I said I'm I'm still reading, she has been referencing non-white people in the area of the world known as Australia as black. So that'll be that should be a nice chunk of discussion for the program right there tomorrow. But uh, the showtime tomorrow is uh, 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, 9 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Pacific. Folks in the U.K., it will be real late. Let's see. And they shift the they shift the clock, so I think now it'll be an eight-hour difference. So if you're uh, London side, it will be uh, 3 a.m. So if you have any night owls uh, in the U.K., 3 a.m., you can tune in. Um, 3 a.m. Monday morning, you can tune in. Dr. Ann Patel Gray will be here, white supremacy in Australia. Uh, We're going to take a quick uh, commercial break. We'll be right back, and hopefully we will have news from Justice. Is that correct, Justice? We have news from you? Yes. Groovy. We'll be right back, other side of the commercial, context of white supremacy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the cows. This is Justice here at Block Talk Radio. If you want to learn, listen, understand, and question, go to blogtalkradio.com slash victim dash of dash racism. And for more information on racism and white supremacy, go to my blog, justdojusticetoday.blogspot.com. My email address is justice.asap at yahoo.com. Replace white supremacy with justice, ASAP. You're just saying just buckets and buckets of words. So up down on the corner, up town. I turned around and hit a sound. A voice is talking about who's gonna die next. Cause the white man's got a god complex. Silent niggas scream for help. Ah, help me, help me. Nigga, make your own help. Shit, you need it. 
Quite a few non-white people who have uh, really made an effort to uh, do music that addressed racism, white supremacy, and did so uh, very effectively. Uh, probably why white people have their hands all in, uh, in the entertainment industry to make sure that you have things that uh, are not constructive and do not sound like what you just heard, uh, which is uh, the last poet's uh, The White Man's Got a God Complex. I played that because I went through the archives and I heard a progast uh, pro from about a year ago, and that song got referenced, and I said I was going to play it on the program, and I never got around to playing it. So just X that off the list. Uh, if anybody has been keeping tabs, I had said uh, long ago I was going to play it on the program, and there you go. I do think it's constructive, and uh, I think it's fitting, uh, giving the title of uh, Dr. Les's book, uh, Whiteness Made Simple, quite fitting. Uh, with that, before we go to justice for news, uh, I'm also attempting to stick to my commitment of sharing uh, a racist joke. Uh, every program, I think you can learn a lot, and, and you all can give feedback. You know, hearing these jokes, you can let me know if you have learned anything, if you found it interesting. Uh, you know, and you can let me know if you if you hear a racist joke, please. I would love if you would share, write it down, let me know. I think that would be great. You can really do a lot just uh, paying attention to the words and what the metaphors, uh, what the jokes are trying to convey. So this joke, and this is kind of a long one, right? You got to wait for the punchline. So be patient. A man walks into a bar with a picture of a cat. He tells the bartender. 
It's $100 for the picture and $100 for the story behind it. The bartender says he'll take the picture but doesn't care about the story. At the end of his shift, he throws it in the back seat of his car and drives home. He notices thousands of cats following his car. He gets worried and stops on a bridge and throws the picture off. The thousands of cats jump off too, following the picture. The next day, the same man comes into the bar. He asks the bartender if he's ready for the story behind the picture. The bartender says, no, but if you have a picture of Martin Luther King Jr., I'll take it. I will stop there. Uh, Justice, if you have uh, news items for the day, uh, we are all ready to hear it. Not hearing anything. Uh, are you with us, Justice? And still not hearing anything. Perhaps the white people got her. Let's see. Uh, we'll give her a second and she... Uh, See if she's ready to go. I actually do have uh, a couple news reports myself. I'm not bumping her. I'm just uh, I had news reports myself, so I can share one while I try to figure out what's uh, what's taking place with her line. I am going to. Uh, can I be heard? Get up oh, there. She is. Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah. Um. This uh, news article was um from Lex eighteen dot com, and um. Yeah, and uh, this one is also uh, on the Wii. Um, if anybody has the Wii, yeah, uh, uh, you can read it. It's called uh, "Signs with Racial Language Found on UK Campus." You can uh, go if you uh, just go on the Wii and uh, go to uh, the news channel, and uh, yeah, but it but it might be gone. I I don't know, but uh, yeah. University of Kentucky um, UK officials are trying to find whomever was responsible for posting two signs with racially explicit language directed at Press Obama or on, on campus. The most recent sign was discovered Thursday morning. It was reportedly taken from a bus stop along South Limestone, directly across from the UK Law School. School officials say a law professor discovered the other sign hanging on a, school, on a law school building wall last week. While students were on spring break, he turned it in to UK police. A law student picked up the latest sign and took it into his racism and law class. It became the subject of class A class discussion. A student in that class said the sign shocked him. Uh, this was just a shorter version. Um, there's no more uh, words of uh, on on this website for well for this for this news article. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, my thoughts are on this news article. Um, white people make signs like this uh, a lot about uh, about um, President Obama and uh, other non-white people. Do I think did 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 you, did you read that this happened or that the racist sign was posted near the law school at the University of Kentucky? Is that correct? Um, I believe so. Wow, that's uh, very interesting. <laughs> not uh, not out in the backwoods, uh, in the forest someplace, next to the law school. <laughs> uh, to me, that just, wow, refinement. Uh, I mean, it's interesting because next to the law school, that would, to me, would suggest that these were most likely students, the perpetrators, most likely students. Um, perhaps even law students. 
um, but very crude behavior. It's it's uh, the same thing as the report you read yesterday about the uh, the cross and them lugging the you know eleven foot hundred pound cross uh, to go burn in some black person's yard. Very time consuming, uh, laborious activity uh, to go make a sign uh, to hang it next to the law school. Though that's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Did uh, did you get to see a picture of the sign? What it looked like or no? Um, it might be on the Wii, but uh, there is a video um on alexa18.com for this article. Uh, but um, I, I I don't see any uh any picture of uh the sign. I see. Okay, groovy. I'm gonna check on that to see if I can actually find uh video or if they have any pictures of the. I would like to check those out. If any of anyone listening, if you find uh, images of, of the actual signs, I would appreciate checking them out as well. Um, we have uh, eight minutes left in the live feed. If uh, you want to call in, the number is 347-215-6071. Uh, press 1 if you would like to chat. Um, did you have any other news reports for us, Justice, or is that it? Um, that's it. Uh and then uh yeah, I might have some more later in life, you know. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um yeah, if, if you're interested in watching the video uh for the UK incident that uh Justice just read, um it's pretty easy to find um the lex l e x eighteen dot com uh the website is there so it's pretty easy to to find if you want to check it out i might even po- well actually i'm not going to post it in the description because there's already a a lot of stuff there but uh it might be worth checking out um the few news reports that i found that i wanted to share uh really quick before i hit the phone lines um man oh man i'm just gonna read i'm just gonna read and not offer any commentary i'll check to see if justice has anything she wants to say i have nothing to say about any of these uh other than replace white supremacy with justice uh the first report uh tiger back on the dating scene with 22 year old woman tiger woods has stepped back on the dating scene with a young 22 year old he's known since he was eight years old Uh, The golfer, who recently appeared on Good Morning America, talking about his comeback and personal life, is back on the scene with a girl he used to to live in the same neighborhood as. Uh, Lottie is the daughter of former uh, St. Louis Cardinals pitcher Jeff Lottie. Uh, And this looks like another white woman. Uh, I guess her name is Lottie, L-A-H-T-I. Looks like another white person, blonde hair, blue eyes. yeah, I have nothing to say. Uh, Justice, do you have any any thoughts on that uh, report? Or no? Um, I uh, don't uh, have any. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything. But uh, thank you. Okay, dokie. Uh, let's see. Checking, I had uh, I think two other reports, and then I will. I will hit the phone lines. I got my racist joke in. Check. Let's see. Whew. Oh, wow. There were a lot of news signs. Wow. I'm just going to do two of these. There were a lot of news reports. Uh, non Mighty Wick shared this one uh, yesterday. Uh, Jesu- uh, Jesuits settle sex abuse claims for $166 million, uh in one of the largest settlements in the Catholic Church's sweeping sex abuse scandal. An order of priests agreed Friday to pay $166 million to hundreds of Native Americans and Alaska Natives who were abused at the order's schools around the Pacific Northwest. The settlement between more than 450 victims and the Oregon province of the Society of Jesus also calls for a written apology to the victims and disclosure of documents to them, including their personal medical records. It's a day of reckoning and justice, said Clarita Vargas, who said she and her two sisters were abused by the head of St. Mary's Mission and School, a former Jesuit-run Indian boarding school 
on the Colville Indian Reservation near Omak, Washington in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The abuse began when they were as young as six or seven, she said. My spirit was wounded, and this makes it feel better. The province ran village and reservation schools in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska. The claims are from victims who were students at schools in all five states. Nearly all the victims are Native American or Alaska Native, non-white. The province previously settled another 200 claims. Then the organization filed for bankruptcy in 2009, claiming the payments depleted its treasury. But the victims argued the province remained wealthy because it controls and owns Gonzaga University, Gonzaga Preparatory School, Seattle University, and other schools and properties. Many of the abuses happened in remote villages and on reservations. The order was accused of using those areas as dumping grounds for problem priests. I just want to back up and read that in a codified manner. Uh, many of the acts of maximum racist aggression against seven-year-old children happened in remote so-called villages and reservations. Uh, these are areas of racial dislocation. Uh, these white people, suspected racists, were accused of using these areas populated with non-white people as dumping grounds for priests who were known to have problems with sexually, who were known pedophiles, to be very clear about it. people that were known for sexually abusing uh, other children, these priests priests were deliberately sent to these non-white areas uh, as dumping grounds for problem priests. That's what it says in the report. Both the order and its insurers are paying into the settlement. Although the victims' attorneys initially cited the wealth of the Jesuit colleges and the prep schools in the region, they did not pursue that argument during the bankruptcy negotiations. So the settlement does not include such institutions as Gonzaga University in Spokane, famous for its successful basketball program. The settlement is believed to be the Catholic Church's third largest in the sex abuse cases behind the Los Angeles Diocese, which agreed to pay $660 million to 508 victims, and the San Diego Diocese, which agreed to pay $198 million to 144 victims, according to the website bishopaccountability.org. Hmm. Very, I hope you uh, remember the discussion, the portion of the program with Dr. Les, homophobia, if a uh, proud gay black man is out there. Yet again, the connection between homosexuality and pedophilia on the context of white supremacy. Uh, I'm going to get the people that called in, uh, and then I'll read my last report and hush, see if you all have any comments. Uh, the people that called in that uh, put a hand up, your line is open. Uh, if you could give me one moment to finish this last report, then you can share whatever views or thoughts you might have. Uh, 8162, I have your line as well. Uh, Non-Mighty Wick, I have your line also. Uh, so everyone who called in, your line is open. If you are interested in speaking, press 1. Uh, the last report uh, I wanted to share. Let's see. Oh, okay, here we go. Uh, this is uh, from the New York Times. Navy officers face censure over videos on carrier. This is from March 3rd. Uh, Washington, uh, a senior commander in the United States Navy found fault with 40 officers and sailors on Thursday for their roles in crude, sexually explicit videos that were shown as onboard entertainment from 2005 to 2007 to the crew of the Enterprise, the world's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. The commander... Admiral John C. Harvey, Jr. of the United States Fleet Forces Command in Norfolk, Virginia, said that he was recommending letters of censure 
for Captain Owen Honors, the executive officer of the Enterprise, who created and starred in the videos as well as for three other senior officers. Such letters are rare and typically end a commander's career. Captain Honors was permanently removed from the command of the Enterprise in January, shortly after the videos were first disclosed by a Norfolk newspaper, the Virginian Pilot. Admiral Harvey also said he had issued less severe non-punitive letters of caution, end quotes, to two other high-ranking officers, among them Vice Admiral Daniel Holloway, who commanded the Enterprise Strike Group at the time of the videos and is now the commander of the Navy's Second Fleet. An additional 32 officers and sailors who had a role in the production and broadcast of the videos also received letters of caution. Admiral Harvey said he also said he had also counseled, in quotes, military terminology for a strong verbal reprimand. See, they got their code worked out to other officers about their role in the videos. It is fair to ask how this series of events could happen over such an extended period of time without key leaders aboard Enterprise taking appropriate action. Admiral Harvey said in a statement, the end result of an inquiry into the production of what he said were at least 25 inappropriate videos. The investigation determined the problem stemmed from the fact that the executive officers of Enterprise, the officers primarily responsible for assisting the commanding officer in maintaining good order and discipline and ensuring exemplary conduct were themselves the source of the problem, the statement said. The videos, okay, antennas up. <laughs> the videos included scenes of simulated masturbation, simulated eating of feces, anti-gay anti slurs, two men and two women showering together, and one scene that suggests an officer was engaged in sex with a donkey in his stateroom. Captain Honors starred in many of them. His supporters say they were funny and meant as morale boosters for the 6,000-member crew. But Admiral Harvey said in his statement that he strongly disagreed and that even though vulgar language and insensitive and sexually tinged attempts at humor are part of everyday culture, Navy should rise above that. Navy leaders are not popular entertainers, but professionals vested with an extraordinary military authority who must be held to a higher standard and maintain their credibility in the eyes of their subordinates under the most difficult, even possibly life threatening circumstances, he said in the statement. Eugene R. Fidel, the president of the National Institute of Military Justice, who teaches military law at Yale, said that the reprimands were a carefully calibrated set of sanctions and that a serious effort had evidently been made by the Navy to differentiate the various levels of fault. The Enterprise is now deployed in the Red Sea off the coast of Egypt. Very interesting report, I thought. You know, there are a lot of articles on this issue. Uh, in fact, I read some reports where a lot of white people were coming to these folks' aid saying, you know, this is ridiculous. This was just, you know, a little tomfoolery. They're just having a good time, letting off some steam. What are you getting upset for? You know, what's the big deal about simulating sex with a donkey? Um Racism, white supremacy, the problem is white people. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, everyone who called in with a hand up, your line is open. Gus? Um, Gus? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
Um, do you think, uh, ca uh, could you please uh, say the website uh, first and then uh, read the article? Um, the reason why I say that is because um, if people want to go to that website and then type in the article's name, then uh, they can read along. Because, uh, well, I would, li I would like to read along. Oh, sure. No worries. Uh, anytime we read news reports on the show from now on, we'll read the uh, read the website first, website and title of the article first. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, well, the lines are open. If you all have nothing to say, that's no worries either. <laughs> we can uh, wrap up and come back tomorrow, but the phone lines are open. Uh, don't feel compelled. If you don't have anything uh, to share, that's no worries either. Can I be heard? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, greetings. Um, have you seen that movie, The Mission? With Robert De Niro? Mm, no. Oh, it goes into the uh, Jesuit order and how they uh, send them in. Um, the, I guess they're an order of uh, priests. And I, I guess uh, the way the hierarchy works, the Catholic Church basically uh, controls them. Um, yeah, it's a good movie. It's a good movie on it. On uh, how the uh, Spanish and the, and the uh, Portuguese um, back in the you know when they was doing this in the slave trade, how they uh, switched um, how they switched uh, property basically because uh, I guess Spain had a law that prevented them from uh, um, enslaving so-called uh, Christians. Indians that had converted to Christianity. So what the Portuguese and the Spanish did was they said, okay, well, since we have these laws, we're going to give you our, these properties because the Portuguese didn't have any laws against that. And uh, so the Spanish made a deal with the Portuguese to uh, just, just, you know, a land swap so they can go in and get these, these uh, Indians that had converted to Christianity. It was, it was it was deep, man. It was great. It was just a man. They burnt down all these churches, <laughs> and uh, basically the Jesuits uh, were uh, trying to convince this this priest of the Catholic Church. He went in there to uh, assess the situation to see if he was going to side with the uh, you know with the Spanish, you know, to uh, sell these lands if it was a lawful deal or what what not. And uh, yeah, so the Jesuits had built all these uh, all these churches in Peru, had all these factories teaching uh, the Indians how to you know make violins and uh, uh, you know different instruments, oboes and whatnot. You know, teaching them Christianity, singing in that weird uh, Christian opera style. And uh, yeah, they just went in there and and, and just. Uh, burnt all these churches down, killed all of these so called Christians and Robert De Niro's character, he was a slaver and uh he converted to uh the order of Jesuits. So when uh this deal went down between the well when the uh, Catholic Church decided to decide uh decided to uh side with the uh Portuguese and Spanish to make this deal because basically there their power was in jeopardy. And, man, if you see this movie, I mean, anybody that's, uh, you know, anybody that wants to see a, 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 a excellent movie, watch this movie, The Mission. I mean, you have these you know, this, these white people, they're crying. You know, this priest, this Catholic priest that, you know, went and uh, basically uh, made a deal that benefited him and, 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 the, and the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church was, you know, losing power in Portuguese, uh, in Portugal, I mean. And, uh, you know, they make it, he, he was shedding a tear at the end when all of these, uh, you know, Indians were getting 
shot and killed. They had him like, you know, he shed a tear, like he really regretted his decision. Oh man, it was it was it was interesting, man. You know, just it just it just when you were talking about uh how it was a so called dumping ground, uh that's what they do, man. They the white people it it reminds me of the colonies of, you know, like Australia, you know, where they just basically dump their criminals onto the continent of, you know, Australia. And um, to me, it reminds me of a bomb. You know, we're going it, to, it's like a, to me, it's like a, a what kind of, like a bomb, some type of a, a bomb where they use, a, I don't know, like some type of organic bomb. You just send these lunatics in and, you know, first, and then, you know, they just poison the people's minds, uh, you know, by raping them, to giving them the white Jesus, and, and then the, uh, and then the, uh, the, the state or whatever, they just come in and, and get all the resources once the people have been totally, uh, just ravished mentally, physically, um, yeah. Just found that interesting in that movie, The Mission, man. It basically shows exactly how that is. Oh, Robert De Niro, his character, he wanted to fight. He he was a he was of the Jesuits, but he, the people, the Indians didn't want to leave. They knew that these soldiers were coming to kill them, but they were like, no, you know, Jesus will protect us. Uh, this is our home. We don't want to go back into the forest where we came from because the devil lives up in there. So they didn't want to leave them home. So. Uh, Robert De Niro decided to try and and, and and make some type of stance and fight and so they wouldn't come and kill him and he ended up dying. They they just basically killed everybody. I um uh actually I have a, a video. Uh well it's a movie. Um it's very popular, uh and uh, well it's for the kills in the show. Um it's called a Hotel for Dogs, I think two yeah, I think it's either Hotel for Dogs. Yeah, yeah, Hotel for Dogs, and um, and uh, there's lots of racism in there, and uh, just um, just some things just to look out for is uh, there's this uh, black male, uh, and uh, his name is Bernie, and he's wearing purple, so Barney, Bernie, and he's wearing purple, yeah, and um, he uh, adopts two white uh, two white children. And um, he takes care of them. And, uh, well, he takes care of um, a lot of uh, white children, but he adopts too. And, uh, yeah, he works at an adoption center. And uh, there's also a white dog and a black dog. Uh, and uh, and the black dog's name is uh, Romeo, and the white dog's name is, uh, is uh, Juliet. And uh, the uh, and the white dog and the black dog they kiss. And uh, yeah. Oh yeah, the racism is in all the movies, all the cartoons. It's uh, it's they have this movie came out called True Grit, and it was uh, I guess I don't know if it won an Academy Award or whatnot, but I know a lot of people were talking about it, and in in <laughs> In the movie, uh, there's a there's a horse, and uh, he's a, he's a black horse, and his name is Little Blackie. And you know when I you know in Little Blackie he he gets introduced in the movie at the beginning, so I said I said I wonder what's gonna happen to Little Blackie, <laughs> and what happened to Little Blackie is he ends up getting rolled to death at the end of the movie to save the little white girl. This little white girl that uh gets bit by a snake. So they ride little Blackie like, you know, fifty miles straight, no rest, basically to his he falls out and the the, the, the cowboy uh that was taking the, the girl to uh the doctor, she shoots little he shoots little Blackie in the in the head. And kills him. 
very interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the video that uh, I uh, suggest for the children's show. Um, Gus, are you okay with that? Uh, that's I haven't seen it, but yeah, that sounds great. I um, I would be you know willing to watch it, and any of the folks out there, young people, um, I think we're doing the nine and up uh, for the young people, and then after that we can have another one, and you know anybody out there seven, six, whatever. Um, but yeah, if you if you know non-white children, they don't have to be your child. If you know a non-white child and you think you know uh, his or her parents would be uh, okay with the child participating uh, or children participating uh, in uh, honest, courteous dialogue on racism, would be great. Uh, just shoot us an email and we'll get the date and time worked out. And uh, you want to give them the title of the film uh, one more time. Yes, it's a Hotel for Dogs, but I don't know if it's Hotel for Dogs 2. Um, uh, I'll go look it up and see, but so far it's just Hotel for Dogs. Okay, there you go. Uh, so that, that, I guess, would be the film. Uh, anyone out there, again, if you know non-white children, love to have them on the program. Um, it would be great to hear from them. Uh, just shoot me an email if you all would be down to participate. Justice, do you watch uh, the Nickelodeon and the uh, Disney Channel? Uh, no, I do not. Oh, that's good. Disney is strong. Has a lot of racism. Yeah, I was watching the uh Nickelodeon uh with I was watching it with some with some children and uh I just, you know, was surprised. I don't know why, but I was surprised, man. A lot of the, they had characters named Chester, you know, and uh very it was just a lot of weird characters and I don't think that children know like like um Chester like uh we call, I don't know, Chester, it rhymes with molester, so a lot of people say Chester the molester. And when I was looking at the character on one of the shows, the uh, the character, he, his name was uh, Chester. And he was kind of like, uh, kind of like a, a molester type character because the, the it was a cartoon, but the children in the uh, cartoon, they seem to be uh in a very sexualized um you know uh sexualized children and they were young so uh like i think uh they were supposed to be around ages of uh between 12 and 14 or something like that they were young young and they were very sexualized and i just found it interesting that the character name was Chester and I just think that, um, like, the the writers, they, they did that on purpose. And, oh, they had a commercial. I guess they do the Nickelodeon um, awards. Or, and they had, uh, you know, the, the, the Will Smith and his whole family. They were there and, uh, you know, in support. Um, some other non-white, uh, I see some non-white, um, children, too. I guess they play on some of the shows, and, uh, they had this one clip in the commercial where the non-white, I think it was a, a female, and she was talking at the podium, and then they just, all of a sudden from the podium, all this green slime just shot out the podium onto her. Man, it was, it was just, it was, it was, it was interesting. I mean, I don't know if the guess is correct. I don't know what, I, I just don't know. And I seen all those non-white people there, and then like Will Smith and all that. I mean, 
I don't know if they know that this stuff is totally, it just seems uh, very evil, uh, very evil. Like, they, I don't know how you would, it was, it's like sick, like, it's just sick. And, um, yeah, I don't know how to, I don't know if they know anything about that or how they see it. it or are they just doing it to, uh, are they just participating in this? I mean, to have your children participate in something like that, where all this kind of uh, sick behavior goes down, um, I really don't think that they do. I know he was saying that some, like maybe Barack Obama might have some type of insight. I don't think so. I don't think, I don't really don't think they have any insight at all. I think once they go to these colleges and especially if they get good grades, it seems like, from what I understand, the research I've done, that if you get the straight-A students are the the most brainwashed. It's the ones that, you know, just pass with the C, C average. They're the ones that know that this is basically, you know, a bunch of... Uh, brainwashing and they just do just enough to pass you know the 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 course but those uh what is it uh those what cum laude and all of that uh straight a students um you know they're 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 totally uh they're totally uh brainwashed so i don't think that they i don't think that they know what is what they're doing I think that they're under total mind control. What did you think about that, Gus? Uh, oh, I didn't know if someone wanted to say something. I heard someone breathe. If not, what did you think about? Um, what did you think about? Uh, you know that that premise. Did you? What do you think? You think that they're doing it for some type of gain or do you think that they're I don't know what's your thoughts on it if you have any uh, if, who, uh, if who's doing doing what for some type of gain uh, black people are like what he was saying about Obama or basically I guess he was saying that uh, it's not just white people it's, it's you know black people they they uh if white people were gone tomorrow, that black people would, would pick up their mantle and uh, take basically take over their positions. I don't know. I think I'm adding two or more things. It, it's no big deal. Oh, um, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm I'm leaning more towards. Uh, we were we're attempting to be more codified with words and everything. I think a big part of uh, codification, I'm really trying to stick to uh, not having too much to say about other non-white people. Um, I really would rather focus on uh, on on white people. Um, if I had to make a comment about anybody, I, I would re, uh, reiterate that I think white people are very informed uh, when they go see these films, uh, particularly Disney films, uh, really any of these films, white people are very informed. Uh, they tend to pride themselves on, you know, being in the know uh, and, and being informed uh, about what is happening uh, and making things happen. So uh, if anybody is, is confused or not aware, I think it's non-white people, uh, and I don't think it, uh, it serves victims of white supremacy to uh, give white people the doubt. Uh, under these conditions, uh, I could be incorrect, but yeah, I really uh, would encourage other non-white people to do that too, because I think uh, it's just—I think we talked about it before. I just I think often uh, we're frustrated, we're we're being mistreated, and uh, we end up somehow getting back to focusing on on other non-white people. And and I really want to keep the uh, the bullseye on racist man, racist woman. Uh, so I would tell anyone just kind of watch that and see in conversations, uh, see how often you are you're asked to comment uh, on another non-white person. And then I would also say pay attention to see how many times that goes uh, down the direction of conflict. 
Um, not that, you know, there was anything incorrect about 909. Just I think uh, that's something I want to try and do more of, particularly as we uh, have more conversations with folks from different spots around the world. Um, yeah, just I could see white people uh, trying to instigate conflict, you know, <laughs> like, uh, oh, he said such and such about, you know, you after the program or whatever. Problem is white people. That's what I have to say every day, all day. The problem is white people, white people, white people, and you should be suspicious of them all. Uh, worldwide, uh, be suspicious of them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. I kind of felt it too, just just in the way that I asked the question. Uh, you know what I mean? So yeah, I definitely agree with that. And, uh, we have to be more codified in how we, you know, how we uh, approach or ask, you know, with our language. Because I, I was really just wondering about the, uh, you know, just the just the, the premise of uh, of uh, you know, should we be worried about whether white people. Um, you know, understand or don't understand, uh, you know, their poverty and, and, and whatnot, um, whether black people uh, would take up the mantle of white people, uh, whether that's the question that we, you know, going to sit down and and have with each other. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think it, I don't, one, that's just what my that's where my thinking was. I was just was wondering, uh wondering uh yeah, if that's uh constructive to do. I I, I haven't come to that conclusion though. But I see it kinda just it comes up a lot. It just comes up a lot, you know, the fact that white people don't un, don't know that they're racist or uh, and whatnot. Very, I think it's Can I be heard? Uh, yes. Oh, sorry, no, no, no. If you had a little more to go ahead and say, go right ahead. Um, I just that last point I said uh, was just to to to, to do that, and uh, that's it. Okay. Um, now you know I I've uh I agree. I I think it's. It is worthy of mentioning and talking about because I think a lot of all, I was I used to be very confused about uh, you know how much or how aware uh, the average white person is about you know what's going on in the world and just in conversations in general I used to uh, think that they were not as bright or connected to what's going on as I once thought. So yeah, I think that's um, it's worthy of conversation because I think we get deceived in that way to think that. The people who are running the show, who, white people who uh, practice racism, who have the ability to uh, do more in a system of white supremacy, that they are, I guess, less informed, uh, less bright, less less uh, mindful of what's going on, and that's that's kind of con- that's contrary to logic. So I think it's worth talking about just because a lot of non-white people get confused about that. But yeah, by no means uh, I think should any non-white person be thinking a white person here is. That, that they, you know, that they're not informed, they're not aware of what's going on, whether it, whether you're watching a show or something that's happening on the news or whatever, you know, um, they they uh, like like uh, Gus said, you know, that's one of the things that they really try to be uh, priding themselves on is being informed and and uh, being in the know. My word of caution for victims, I would. Uh... Try to make sure you don't fall in the conversations, arguments uh, with other victims about whether or not white people uh, are informed and how informed they are. Uh, I don't think that's constructive. Um, That's, you know, slaves sitting on the bottom of the ship talking about, you know, how informed do you think Master is about what's going to happen to us? I mean, <laughs> I really don't care. <laughs> like that's that's just not the conversation we should be having uh, right now. Like, uh, and I've I've just seen I've participated in some of those, and they just get really weird. Uh, I would just encourage non-white people study, do some studying. Um, you can converse too, but just I would I'm just saying be cautious to make sure it doesn't go to conflict or it doesn't start to go someplace where it's not really constructive. 
But uh, just do some studying. I think that was really helpful for me, really doing some studying uh, as to how I think white people pick this up, what age do I think white people pick this up, talk to white people and see what they know. I think for me, that really started to fast forward things. When I started to talk to white people and I started to see how much just regular old white people that I would talk to Uh, And I would think, oh, they don't know anything about racism. Then I would start talking to them and they'd be real informed. Like maybe they wouldn't be using the same words that I used. But I mean, we had the same basic understanding of how things worked. Like uh, I would say, just start talking to white people. They what as Mr. Fuller is known for saying, they can show you much better than I can tell you. Uh, However informed they are, what have you, they can give you a live demonstration. I would say spend some time with white people and I think you'll get a uh, a, a speed course. Uh, in how dumb white people are or how informed they are about racism, white supremacy. That would be my suggestion. Don't don't have that conversation with too many other victims. Start talking to white people if you want to find out how smart they are. Um, I, totally agree pre- with, I totally agree. I, I'm, I'm just going to get in real quick. I was just going to say real quick that, that's, that, that that is how I um, came to my understanding on that is, you know, through engaging the enemy. And then you see, I would say one suggestion in doing that is try to get them to do most of the talking. You know, but yeah, yeah, that's a big one. Make sure you're not talking. Make sure go ask white people some questions. Start asking them some questions. Pay attention to which questions they answer, the questions that uh, excuse me, the answers that they give, which questions they don't answer. If they get frustrated, what they get frustrated about. Just you know, go spend some time chatting with white people, and you'll get to see uh, how informed they are. Um, with that, if you all have uh, anything you want to get in, um, I'd like to wrap up by 11.35. It's 11.32, and uh, I will even be quiet myself. We'll be back tomorrow. Showtime is 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Dr. Ann Patel Gray, uh, The Great White Flood, Racism, White Supremacy in Australia, should be very constructive. She seems very informed. She's non-white. And uh, she was excited about the prospect of coming on the program, so should be constructive. Uh, feel free. Uh, see if we can do it in, in three minutes. Um, Gus, you were kind of, uh, like, breaking up a little bit. Like, when, like, like uh, first, like, you were saying something, and then it stopped. And then you were saying something, and it stopped. Uh, I said I'd like to end the program in three minutes. Program will be back tomorrow uh, at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 Pacific. Dr. Ann Patel Gray, and uh, yeah, that's that's the short of what I had to say. I hope that came through clear. Anything else or anything else? Anything else? Groovy. Good to hear from everyone. Still morning. Uh told you I really am not in for morning shows. <laughs> it is uh it is like a battle of attrition to do uh morning programs. Uh at least for me. I'm not a morning person and uh this one started at nine AM Pacific, so I'm looking forward to uh Waking up and uh, enjoying the rest of my Saturday and prepping for tomorrow's broadcast. Uh, Please let me know about the children's broadcast. I think Justice would really appreciate that. If you know children, anyone out there, 909, I think you said you were working with some younger non-white people. Um, Get them on the program. I would love to hear from them. We can get a date and time. We'll work it out for their schedule. Um, Yeah, we'd really like to make that happen ASAP. Um, Also, Dr. Cambon, I definitely want him back on the program. Uh, Invest. Uh, and earmark specifically for Dr. Cambon, and uh, we can get him back as soon as possible. I know he would uh, he would be willing to come back and speak with us again. So, thank you for tuning in. We'll be back tomorrow, Sunday, March twenty seventh. Dr. Ann Patel Gray, context of white supremacy. Thanks, everyone. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. The problem is white people worldwide. <laughs>